cold. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Perfect. Let me just get everything situated up here real quick. Ah, thanks, Tim. That's good. <laughs> That's weird. Okay, one sec. You might have jinxed me, Joe. <laughs> Try replugging it in. That's not what's showing up on my screen. Okay. Okay, uh, we're just gonna go without it. Uh, I can't get it popped up and I'm not wanting to mess with it too much, so that's all right. For our guests, we usually don't have this much computer trouble, but <laughs> today it's just, everything's going on. That's all right, that's all right. But I want to start off by saying thank you. I know that there's some new faces in here and some guests, and I just want to say how happy we are, and we hope that you have felt nothing but love and openness as you've come here. And uh, I pray that you are uh, uplifted because of the service. But So as many of you guys know, I'm preparing to go to school for preaching, and uh, in addition to my regular Bible reading, I'm uh, going through works. And I read a lot of Eldred Stevens' work, and uh, you know I was kind of finishing that up, and... Um, trying to find out what to read next. And my, my wonderful fiance brought me a book and uh, it's called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So I went ahead and I went through this book and uh, it, was, it was interesting to say the least. And sometimes when you're reading two separate things, especially something that is of the Bible and then something else that's pertaining to the Bible, you're able to draw similarities between the two. And uh, that's what I was able to do in my study with Josiah and uh, elementary principles based upon this book. So. Before I tell you a little bit too much, we're gonna dive in and we're gonna talk a little bit about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the guy that wrote this book. So usually I'd have a picture of him right here, but we're, we're lacking that today, that's all right. So he's a German theologian born right about 1906. He uh, studied theology at the University of Berlin and uh, after this, he went to the Union Theological Seminary in New York City, and uh, he attended a black congregation there, and um, he always writes so fondly about the friendships that he made within the United States and uh, the friendships that he made at that congregation. But then, so he, he finished his study, and in 1931, he went back to be a professor and a preacher over in Berlin. He was a professor at the University of Berlin. And uh, right about 1937, he wrote the book that I read, uh, The Cost of Discipleship. And in this book, he dissects the ministry of Christ and the call of his disciples. He goes over what discipleship means in the present day. So I went ahead and I got a little bit, uh, a little verse out of this book that he wrote. And I'll just read it to you guys to give a little bit of the vibe of this guy. So the cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering, which every man must experience, is the call to abandon the d attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man, which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Galatians 2.20 reads, It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth within me. So now if you have your Bibles and want to turn with me, we're going to jump over to 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 21 and do a brief little study over Josiah. And we're going to start this off by prefacing his life with the life of his father. Amen. Okay. 
Okay, 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 21. Pick up there. Amon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. Verse 22. But he did evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. And then uh, beyond this, going forward a little bit, you're going to read a little bit more of the evil that he did. Uh, pretty stereotypical with the bad kings of Judah. Here in 23, we'll pick up there. He did not humble himself before the Lord as his father Manasseh had humbled himself, but Amon trespassed more and more. So what can you read out of this first little bit? You're going to see that Amon, his father, was obviously evil. He worshipped false gods and served false gods. And you're going to get this contrast here in 23 with his own father, Manasseh. And we did a little study on Manasseh like a month ago. Uh, Manasseh was that king. He was probably the most evil king in Judah. He sacrificed children. He uh, worshipped false gods for like the entirety of his life. He was just terrible. And then he ends up getting bound and brought to Babylon. And when he's held captive, he humbles himself and turns to God and reforms himself. He's ultimately freed, goes home, reforms Judah a little bit, and then he, he dies. So it's like for the vast majority of his life, he's bad. And for the vast majority of his son's life, he's bad. He's a bad dad, right? And uh, you can see here, this is the comparison. Amon does not humble himself, and he keeps trespassing more and more. And we're going to actually finish out Amon's life here in 24. His servants conspired against him and killed him in his own house. So that's it. He dies at 24 years old. And uh, his life is summed up in like four sentences. It's, it's pretty insignificant. He's just bad. Um, but a couple points that you can get out of this. So he's 24 when he dies. If you're king and you're 24, your son's going to take your place. If you're 24, your son's going to be pretty young, right? And you're going to see that here in 34, verse 1. His son, Josiah, is going to be eight years old when he becomes king. So now we can get into a little bit of the early life of Josiah. So you're going to see here in verse 3, In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places. And it goes into a little bit further about what he's doing with this Reformation. But the big point I want us to get out of these two points is, in the eighth year of his reign, at 16, he began to seek God. He's 16 years old, and he's revealing what his heart is going to be like for the rest of his life. In the twelfth year, at 20 years old, he purges and reforms Judah. He's young through all of this, and he's showing his heart. And you can read a little bit more. When he goes through and he reforms Judah and he purges it, like, he, he gets rid of everyone that's bad, like the false priests and everything. Like He doesn't send them to a different country. He, he puts them in the dirt. Like it's, He's kind of done with them. But... Uh, Go ahead and dig in a little bit further. Jump with me here to verse 8. He's going to end up uh, rebuilding the temple. And uh, in doing so, he's going to discover something. But we'll pick up here in verse 8. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land of the temple, he sent Shaphan the son of Azaliah, Maaseah the governor of the city, and Joah the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. So he's 18th year. He's only 26 when he's doing this. Here in 14, we're going to find out what they find when they're repairing the house. 14. Now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. 15. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and Shaphan carried the book to the king. What did he find? He found the book of the law of Moses. It's the, it's the Pentateuch. It's the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And you're going to have him read it before the king here just before 19. We'll pick it up there. Shaphan read it before the king. And we're going to get Josiah's reaction here in 19. We already know that Josiah's heart is after God, but now he's actually given the word of God. You're going to get some miracles and some amazing things out of this. 19. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. This is Jewish tradition, meaning grief, sorrow, death, and loss. He is sorrowful for the life that he lived before this point in uh, disobedience to the word of God because he didn't have the word of God to judge it. He only had his morality and his conscience and stories that were given to him, but now he has it. The old king before this is dead. 
Josiah after this is a completely different man. And uh, the way I take this as we go forward, he's hearing the call of God to change. He's hearing the call of God on how to run his country through the word, exactly how we hear the call of God. It's through the word of the Lord that we read, right? Jump forward to 21 here. Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us. And because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. He's sorrowful. And you're going to see here in 29, just like us Christians, when we have a heart for God and we have the word of God, what do we do? We spread it. Uh, Josiah is going to do a similar thing uh, here with the nation of Judah. Uh, pick up here in 29. Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites and all the people great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. He's reading it aloud for all to hear. He's, uh, he's spreading the word of God, and you're going to get great things out of this. Here, uh, towards the end of verse 33, you're going to see that all his days, the people did not, did not depart from the following of the Lord God, their fathers. And, you know, as he went through Exodus and he went through Deuteronomy, he, uh, he read of the Passover. And in Exodus and Deuteronomy, you learn that you're supposed to keep this for generations and that he was supposed to keep this. The Jews up until this point, they have not kept the Passover since the days of Samuel. That's like a 1100. We're at 625. It's been 500 years. They haven't kept the Passover and they're supposed to. So 35 verse one, he's going to instate the Passover. 35 verse one. Now Josiah kept a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem and they slaughtered the Passover lambs on the 14th day on the first month. So he did exactly as he was supposed to on the day he was supposed to for the first time in generations. He heard the word of the Lord and has transformed him. He heard the call of God and he answered it with obedience. And uh, this kind of this kind of finishes out our study of Josiah. Uh, if any of you guys know Josiah deeply after this, he not much happens. He actually dies at a young age. He dies at 39. And uh, kind of being foolish, he gets caught with an arrow in a situation that he shouldn't have been in. And then uh, his sons take over, and uh, then the nation just goes downhill, and they're exiled to Babylon in accordance with what Isaiah said to Hezekiah. But I want us to focus on him answering the call of God. And now, if you have your Bibles and want to turn with me, we're going to contrast him with three would-be disciples. So please turn with me to Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. We're going to go ahead and we're going to study over some people who heard the call of Christ and denied the call of Christ. Luke chapter 9, verse 57. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to read through this whole interaction, and then we're going to dissect it uh, one person at a time here. 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. 58. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid farewell to who are at my house. 62. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Go ahead, and we're going to reread the first. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The first man offers to follow Christ without being called. Christ warns the man he does not know what he is offering. He shows the man that discipleship's me discipleship means suffering and social rejection. Christ and the cross are the embodiment of rejection. The Messiah was pure and blameless, yet was led to that cross of Golgotha to die that shameful death on behalf of us and our trespasses. 
As Christians, we are also to be hated and rejected. Christ clearly said in John chapter 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. To be ostracized and rejected are not just the marks of the church. They are the, remar or they are, they are the marks of true discipleship of Jesus. The second man. <coughs> Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. The second man is blinded by burying customs, tradition, and law. He put his own desires above the will of Christ, saying, Suffer me first, or let me go first. He loved his earthly father more than he loved his heavenly father. Uh, Matthew 10, 37, a verse that we know well. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Christ is above bearing customs. Christ is above tradition. Christ is above any law. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. You know, I, I love Allie with my whole heart. Um, from, the, from the first second I saw her, I don't know if any of you know this, I met her in a grocery store. From the first <laughs> second I saw her in that baking aisle, I knew that she was pretty. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we went on our first date, and after our first date, I knew she was cool. <laughs> and uh, by our second date, I was head over heels in love with this woman. I was, I was ready to get down one knee and marry her right there. And uh, you might think, that was a pretty good second date. Well, she, she let me know that her family has 100 acres in small-town Montana, and they're itching for someone to take it over. So I said, all right. <laughs> I'll take that job. I'll marry her. <laughs> no, no, that's true, but not totally true. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I love Allie. I love my dog, Titus. I love hunting. I love Saturday mornings in a duck blind. I love every single person here. I love every single person in the Lord's church. I love my neighbors. I love the world, but nothing will surpass the love that I have for my perfecter, and that is Christ Jesus. Amen. Finish this out with the third man. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Oh, pick up from that. 60. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. 61. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell to who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. The third man, he believes he can come to Christ on his own terms, saying, Lord, I will follow you. But like the first man, he's offering to follow Christ without being called. Christ rebukes him by saying, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. When Peter was on that boat and on that water, when he was going out to Christ and uh, going to walk in that water, what happened first before he walked on the water? Christ called him to do it. It's only by the calling of Christ are you able to fully obey his will. If Christ is your center and focus and he calls you, there is only one answer, and that is obedience. All other answers reveal your heart. Bonhoeffer wrote in his book, only those who believe obey, and only those who obey believe. It is impossible to fully obey Christ if you do not fully believe Christ. To conclude Luke 9, none of the men put Christ above all else. Once called, Christ should be the center and focus of our foundation and foundation of our lives. Why? Because he is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith in accordance with Hebrews 12. He is our chief cornerstone in, in accordance with Ephesians 2.20. And he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Christ goes on to say in Matthew 10, 37, 38, he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And, you know, we, we went through a negative interaction with Christ or people who reacted to Christ negatively. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. So uh, we're going to jump over to Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to finish this out with people who accepted the call of Christ. So please, if you could turn with me, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18 to start. Okay, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. We're going to start out here with Peter and Andrew. 
And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. 19. Then he said to them, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed Christ. They simply answer in obedience. They plunge into discipleship, not by their own terms, not by their own actions, but by simply obeying the terms and actions of Christ. Uh, the two key pieces of this interaction you're going to see in verse 20. What did Peter and Andrew reply to Jesus? They didn't say anything. It was nothing. No, suffer me first. No, let me first. Nothing but obedience to Christ. The second key piece is the adverb in verse 20. They immediately, not a week, not a day, not an hour, not a single second later, they immediately left everything they have to follow Christ. We'll finish this out with James and John here in 21. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In the boat was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately, once again, they left their boat and their father and followed him. James and John are called, and they have a family just as the third would-be disciple did in Luke 9, but they answer quite differently. They immediately leave their trades and their families to follow Christ. They leave the security that they think they have in their trades and their family to follow the insecurity of Christ. In actuality, they're leaving it for the absolute security of following Christ. They're leaving the temporary for the infinite. They're leaving the perishable for the unperishable, even if they did not fully understand it yet. And uh, as we know, Matthew chapter 4 was just the beginning. Uh, these four disciples have lives ahead of them that would produce greatness, yet also misery and rejection for Christ's sake. You can see in Acts chapter 12 that James is the first apostle to die, killed by the sword in accordance with Herod. And you're going to see that John is believed to be the last uh, apostle to live. He uh, suffered greatly uh, for the faith that he has in Christ. But... Uh, Ultimately, they all prevail through death and their misery and reside with our Lord now. So uh, I talked a lot about Bonhoeffer and uh, his book, but I believe that if you actually study who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is, uh, you learn more about, uh, more about discipleship just by how he lived his life. So uh, I said in 1931, he heads back to Germany. He heads back to Berlin. And if you know anything about history, Germany from like 1933 to 1945, pretty terrible place like six million death murder um thievery just an absolute genocide of an entire group of people it's atrocious and him being a christian man he could not stand for this so he was one of the leaders one of the founders of what's called the confessing church in uh, germany and it was a group of about seven thousand pastors banded together uh, to stand in opposition with hitler and stand for the jewish people at the time and uh, many of these preachers and uh, pastors, they end up getting arrested and they get sent to prison because they're a part of this church. And uh, he, beyond this also, he has a brother-in-law who's in government too, and he's learning about the atrocities that's going on in concentration camps. Like most of the Germans, they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know all the evil, not the murder, the genocide, all this, but he did. So he took it upon himself to lead multitudes of Jews out of Germany into allied countries, risking his own life and his own safety so that they can be set free and they could escape this evil. And uh, like I said, his brother-in-law, he was also in uh, government and he also stood in opposition with Hitler and he was actually part of an assassination attempt. And uh, if you guys like Tom Cruise movies, he has a movie called Valkyrie. And uh, the opening scene of this movie, Hitler gets up on a plane and there's a bomb on the plane. And uh, you know, they're sitting around, they're waiting for the call to see that Hitler blew up and he's dead or whatever, and they never get it. Because Hitler goes up with the bomb, and he lands with the bomb, and it doesn't go off. Hitler lives, and he, he goes on to do horrible things. But they track down this bomb, and they figure out this plot, and they trace it back to Dietrich's brother-in-law. And they end up arresting him and searching through all of his things. And in this, they find a little bit of what Dietrich's doing and Dietrich's involvement with all this. So they arrest Dietrich Bonhoeffer right about like 1943. 
So Dietrich goes to prison. He thinks it's going to be a short time, and it just keeps dragging on. Years go by. He only sees his fiance once. He writes books, finishes books, um, but it's starting to become a realization that he might never make it out of this prison. And fast forward to 1945, Berlin is in ruins, Germany is in ruins, they're about to lose the war. They know that they're about to lose. So they take the people of this, of this, uh, of this place in Germany, all the prisoners, and they take them to Flossenburg concentration camp. And Dietrich is brought with them. So they're at Flossenburg in 1945. He stands, uh, he stands in front of a judge, and his judge reads off uh, his treason against the country, you could say. And he gives no defense. Uh, from there, he is brought to the gallows, naked and afraid. And uh, here are his last words right before he was hung. This is the end for me, the beginning of life. And then he is hung and killed as a martyr because of his faith that he had for Christ and what he did for the Jewish people. Eight years prior in the book that I read, in reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he put his own spin on it by saying, every Christian will have their own cross to bear in their lifetime, but the chosen few will pay the ultimate price, and that is martyrdom. He paid that ultimate price for his faith. This brought me to mind to the la some of the last words of Stephen, Acts chapter 7, verse 59 through 60. Stephen says as he's getting stoned, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord, do not charge them for this sin. Ultimately, this brought me to the words of Christ on the cross. On that cross, Christ said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. In conclusion, the call of Christ is hard. Nothing else can be so countercultural, so in opposition to the flesh, seem so counterproductive to the secular man. To each day, strive further into discipleship, to strive to love your enemies more, to strive to bless your persecutors, and to strive to be more Christ-like is incredibly hard. But Christ calls us to full-pledged discipleship of Him. Once we are buried with Christ in baptism, we die to our old selves and sin. It is no longer we that live, but Christ that lives in us. Christ is our perfecter, our savior, our chief cornerstone, and to give him anything less than your full allegiance is a full mockery. He deserves everything from us. Why? Because Christ gave everything to us. Uh, at this time, if you are a guest here or if you have any needs of the church, if you have not yet put on Christ through baptism, uh, Philippians 4, 7, you receive the Holy Spirit in accordance with Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And Philippians 4, 7, he is the absolute peace. There is nothing like the peace that we have in our Lord Jesus. Uh, if you have not yet put on Christ through baptism, I encourage you to come forward. Or if you have any needs of the church, please come forward while we stand and sing the song of invitation.